for the golden age of the sword and sandals. Okay, so after the post-war, we come into the golden age of sword and sandals. And the reason this, this comes about, I mean, it's always been a popular subject, but what was developed after World War II that threatened the movie industry? The sound had been around since the 20s. Color? Color? No. Not, not what was invented in film, but what was invented in the world. Television. 1950s. Television. 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 Why would you go pay money to go to the theater and pay for that expensive food when you can stay at home and watch TV? So, before television was invented, the aspect ratio of a movie was about like this. About like your television. But in order to compete with television, they invented Panavision, Cinemascope. And, Cinemascope, and the best things, again, you're not going to film something taking place in people's living room, are epics, pageants, costumes, sets, marching throngs of soldiers. So this was the golden age of, and this doesn't even like show it at a good ratio, so in order to compete with television, movies were trying to show you things that you couldn't see at home. And when you watch your viewing for this week, you're going to see a whole lot of previews for the golden age of sword and sandals. And what I want you to be looking for is the language they use. Exciting. A cast of thousands never seen before. It's not even so much about the story. It's about this spectacle, the experience of watching. Now remember, we did not have computers. Not we, I mean, I wasn't born in the 50s. <laughs> Although somebody was. Um, well, they didn't have internet. They, they, you just watched what was on TV on three channels. You just couldn't call up Spectacle at any time. So you had to go to the movies. Unless you were in my house. I could create a Spectacle at any time. Yes. <laughs> so you get a lot of ancient and biblical and also quasi-biblical, like the robe that, that I showed you a second ago. It's not a biblical story, but it takes place around the crucifixion. The same thing as Quo Vadis. This is early Christian uh, woman and a Roman soldier. Can they find true love and will he find Christ? Um, these other things, you know, they're all set in that period, not necessarily historical. And they were huge. They were big box office. They were the thing to see for about 15 years. And then Cleopatra, 1963. Bankrupt bankrupted the studio and killed the costume, biblical, historical epic. Because... <laughs> and what a scandal these two had. Um, <laughs> Dr. Weinland, again, would you like to comment on the historical accuracy of Miss Cleopatra there? Well, there was a woman named Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. She did live in Egypt. Mm -hmm. She did meet a guy named Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. Did she have a bouffant? She didn't quite do her hair that way, nor did she look like Elizabeth Taylor. If she had to be <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor, she could have done a lot more harm than she did already. Okay, so this is a famous <laughs> flaw. It costs millions of dollars and broke up several marriages and there were all sorts of delays and... Broke up several marriages. Well, yeah, she was married to Eddie Fisher and she left him for Richard Burton, who I believe also had a wife at the time and it was a huge tabloid scandal. It was like the Brad and, and Angie of the day. But anyway, <laughs> by 1963, people were really tired of it. You know, they've been watching this spectacle and the color and the marching soldiers and everything for 10, 15 years, seen it, done it. And there's a move to this like more gritty, small, realistic, personal dramas, sort of the new Hollywood age was coming in. Um, and people just didn't have an appetite for this foolish spectacle. So the ancient and biblical epic, dead. 
And what do we get in its place? Although not nearly, I mean, this was huge. I mean, it was a huge business, you know, studios were putting money into. But then we get to the era of hippie Jesus. Now, can anyone identify any of the hippie Jesus? Yes. Yes, Joseph and the Tech Pelagoli dream coat. Hold on, is that Jesus, Jesus Christ Superstar? Yes, Jesus Christ Superstar. Super and it may not look so anachronistic until you see this guy's hippie vest here, and this, yeah. this one's low-slung belt, and the fact that they're all singing and dancing as they're walking down there. And this guy, I don't know what they were thinking, casting this guy as Jesus, because okay, he looks on. like what a cult movie? leader. Yeah, what is Godspell. This? this is Godspell. Oh, he looks like Karen Powerdale. Godspell is told in parables in the park, in modern day. It has songs. It is yeah, painful. It is painful to watch. watch it, it would be less <laughs> painful if they didn't have this freaking cult leader playing Jesus. So, this was not a bright, shining moment. So this would be, you know, yeah, late 60s through 70s. Okay. So, Things are very dark in the ancient and biblical world. Sadness reigns. You've got all you've got all these you know big concept pictures. You know, you know many many a fine film is made, but ancient and biblical, as we know, the sword and sandals epic is dead, 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 and it's never coming back. Until who can tell me what it was? He arises. Maximus, Spartacus, Spartacus came out, and man, was that good. So, so this changes everything. This was such a huge, colossal hit, and it's not, it's historical fiction. It is not, you know, a Bible story. It's, it's not recreating an actual event. Uh, got some sort of historical characters, but suddenly the appetite for this kind of movie is back, and it makes so much money that now filmmakers are once again ready to sink that kind of money into the uh, ancient epic, which really emphasized this time action. The old sword and sandals movies were about pageantry and marching and costumes and we're all going to line up on the stage so you can see how much money MGM has spent on our headdresses. <laughs> the new age of ancient cinema is about kicking butt. And so it also had its sort of glory period, which uh, Alexander there sort of, you know, helped to tank that. So, you know, these things go in cycles. So this came back around again. <laughs> and, and this is the period that this is one of the reasons that Dr. Wineland decided to teach this class because he gets so many questions about films like this saying, is this accurate? Did this really happen? Did the, is this true? You know so, the short answer is, no. no. <laughs> you also get a lot of television shows. Oh, and oh, generally speaking, the television shows tend to be more sexy, soap opery less historically accurate, like uh, that horrible Spartacus thing and the Romans. Yes? I have one question. What is that movie on the far left? Mm -hmm. uh, King, King Arthur. King Arthur, that's the one with oh. Kira Knightley, all oh. painted blue. Oh. And, um, so most of the television shows are not accurate and pretty crappy and pretty highly sexualized. However, Dr. Wyland does watch one, The Vikings, you would give the thumbs up on the Vikings? Uh, yeah, I like the Vikings. Yeah. That's medieval, not ancient. It's still a time period that we are not generally familiar with, and it's still bred from the same interest in the ancient epic. Which brings us up to new Christian cinema. So when the ancient uh, secular epic started getting big again. That also gave sort of renewed interest going back to the biblical stories again. And of course, uh, very famously, The Passion of the Christ, which was going so far into historical accuracy that he did it in Aramaic. 
and is known for its, you know, brutality and you know the realism of it. You know, the the ones from the 50s and 60s were very clean, very shiny, very well studio lit. Very much. Like, exactly. Oh, These things are really going for a lot more realism, <laughs> and in many ways achieved it, but also some more than others, respecting the fact that the audience for this kind of story are Bible fans. Just the way you don't mess with the Lord of the Rings, or you're going to have a lot of Lord of the Rings fans really mad at you, you probably don't want to be messing with this stuff. So there's been some really great ones, and it was a great revival, and a lot of good films you can go back and see. And there are some that maybe aren't so good. Uh, yeah. well, I'm just wondering why people in this extremely, extremely ancient time are wearing jackets. Wait, what, in Noah? Yeah, they, uh, wear, well, they wear leather jackets. Uh, Noah's leather jacket is the least of the problems with Noah. Oh. So, and this is where you start going off the rails again. If you're going to build a story based Art. on, yes sir? If you're going to build it's an, an arc. Oh. If you're going to build your story based on a biblical story, and you're going to sell it as a biblical story to attract people who like the Bible, you know, what do you think? And the people who want to go see a Russell Crowe action movie aren't going to go because I don't want to see that Bible nonsense. And the people who do want to see a biblical film aren't going to go because this thing's idiotic. Um, and of course, it was made by, um, I can't think of his name, he's the one that just did Mother, uh, Darren Aronofsky, who makes crazy, crazy movies. So again, Noah, you know, again, is the end of that sort of uh, sweep. Is that my last picture? No, it's not. Okay. So here are our questions. You're going to be putting in your noggin when you're doing your ancient biblical. Is it wrong to take liberties? You know, is it, you know, when you are interpreting, and this is not just the ancient, this is specifically religious texts, specifically the Bible, although there are other films about, you know, other faiths. Um, it depends. Hmm? I said it depends, you know? Yeah. You don't have to answer right now. No. Just keep in mind when you're writing. Okay. Is it okay to take liberties? Or, if, again, like in the biography, if you're sort of condensing things and rewriting things and rearranging things in order to share the story with more people, is that okay? And whose interpretation? Um, you may have heard there are different interpretations of biblical history. So, when the filmmakers are putting their million dollars into millions of dollars into making their film, Whose interpretation are they going to go with? And also, why are we even discussing this in a history class? Should religious texts be viewed as historical records? And I want you to be asking yourself when you're writing your paper. Do filmmakers have any obligation to separate history from fantasy? No. I mean, other than the flying dragons, they have to tell you, hey, this didn't really happen. Or the 300. Now, nobody, except for John and his friends, heard of the Battle of Thermopylae before the 300. Now everybody's interested in them. So is it okay to make this silly fantasy fight film if it shares a part of history? Or does it just get the history so wrong that they had no business making it in the first place? And if you're gonna change a story that substantially, like the Noah thing, why not just create a new fictional tale with different title and character names? You know, these are all questions you want to be thinking about. Now I want to talk about your viewing assignment. You're going to be watching an episode of Ancient Aliens. So, the reason I'm having you watch this, you know, it's not really true. But, it is presented on the History Channel. History Channel. And is construct it's beautiful. I just the reason you're watching it is because I was watching it one time while I was sewing just a couple weeks ago. And it is put together so well 
and so straight-faced that it seems like they're telling you that there are a number of crystal skulls from ancient times that are connected. So specifically what I want you to watch for are uh, terminology. Um, look out for phrases like ancient people and Native Americans. Exactly, during what period? Um, also, they jump around from uh, a wide geography, a wide time. Look for what specific texts do they cite? What experts do they have talking to? And the experts that they have, what do they actually say? So actually, your quiz is going to be about this as well. And so the questions you're going to be looking for are going to be on top of that, that viewing as well. The reason I'm having you do this for something that is so patently ridiculous is that I want you to train yourself to ask these questions even when it doesn't seem ridiculous, when it does seem um, like something that you could, that, that seems true. How much time do I got left? Well, you have plenty of time. Oh, good, you're gonna come right after me because I'm about to finish. You got 20 minutes. Great, so let me tell you. I'm up one night, click, 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 and I don't know if it was on the History Channel or the Discovery Channel or something, but it was a show about um, the uh, lake monster in Lake Champlain. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a prehistoric monster in Lake Champlain. Well, I didn't until I started watching the show. <laughs> and so every segment, they would say, could it be that, you know, and they give some theory for this prehistoric monster, and then they would have an expert on who would say, well, you know, because of this, that, and this, we looked at this, whatever, no, that theory can't be true. And so I, you know, start to, oh my good, that's over. And then right before they went to the commercial, they would say, but what about such and such? Could it be? And then I'd be like, you know, through the commercials again. It was like 3 a.m. and I'm watching this thing. And by the time I went to bed, I was convinced that there was a monster in Lake Champlain. Even though the people who were talking were actually saying, well, no. But the way this was put together, you know, I'm all over it. But again, eventually I came to my senses and thought, well, maybe, probably not. But could it be? I don't know. On the other hand, <laughs> when I often, you know, I watch a lot of uh, nerdy shows, and I often tape things like, um, oh, Frontline or um, Nova, the science show, that sort of thing. And especially around Easter time, they have a lot of shows on of ancient history or biblical history, which I will take, and then we'll sit down with Dr. Weinland and say, oh, you like this show. This is, you know, this is like, oh, where did Jesus walk? Or was Paul, you know, do the historic Paul or something like that? And so they'll have an expert come on and say such and such. And he will say, that guy, I know that guy. That guy thinks such and such. After they said this, the next thing they're going to say is that, you know, and then, you know, it'll be some version of different biblical interpretation. And sure enough, a couple scenes later, someone will come on and say, you know, why does he know that? Because he has a PhD in ancient history. So he knows all the different viewpoints, and he knows who has them. And so he can watch it. When I watch it, it seems like this is the only viewpoint, and this is the facts, and there's experts right there that say, you know, PhD, so this must be true. But he's so knowledgeable that he's like seeing everything all over the place. Now, of course, we all can't be knowledgeable about everything, and eventually you will be so knowledgeable about something that people will not want to watch a movie or TV show about that thing because you're like, well, you know, that gun wasn't invented until five years later, you know, this, you know, happening, or, you know, someone like me, then, oh, they would never wear that. Um, so, does a John Wyland ruin the viewing experience for you? So, yes. <laughs> yes. I want you to think about that, you know, the middle ground between the ancient alien guy, who's really convinced that, that about the crystal skulls, and nitpicking, well, he's talking about the early date of the Exodus, and of course, you know, we're talking about the later date of the Exodus, and so, you know, stuff that only biblical scholars are going to argue.
Also, and I, this is especially what I want you to look here. You see people all the time interviewed on Talking Heads on these shows with a little identification. Does it say John Wyland, alien expert? If John Wyland goes on one of these shows, a legitimate, well-known show, it's going to say John Wyland, PhD, and ancient and biblical history, and then give either Miami University, where he got his PhD, or Southeastern University, where he works. It is far more trustworthy to see any expert that has an institution under their name, because that means that whatever they're saying is cool with those people, because if John Wyland went onto a show and said, uh, you know, I'm a you know an ancient history expert and the Bible the Loda, and they just made that whole thing up, Southeastern University, <laughs> there would be some repercussions for that. So, look for, you know, an, an institutional or a published book or something better than Sasquatch Hunter. So. That's everything I have to say about ancient and biblical questions. Questions about the class, questions about ancient and biblical, questions about your topics, your questions. So Technical problems. What slide was it on how to write a paper? Like what Both specific in, in your syllabus and in, I think, yeah, yeah and it may be in the second presentation, there's something that breaks it down that says title, is it a book or a movie, what sort of, what date was it yes. made, what date was it based on, are the characters historical, is the setting historical, all of that. So it's both in your syllabus and on her Yes. Just making sure that like, the one that's up to this Sunday is the yes. documentary, right? Yes. Okay, so Whatever I said last Wednesday is due 11 days later. So... Okay. I can't keep that. So what, what she says so today. This will be done due yeah, it's different. 11 days from now. No, I think. But it's different because. 11 days from now. Yeah, what about something else? I thought that was a full No, it's a biography. It's all yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's the reason biography. I'm, you know, doing that. Doing that. I do not have it memorized, especially because of the hurricane. Yeah. Dr. Wyman will assist you in this matter. I will. <laughs> it's on. It's on. It's. The, you ha still haven't updated the master syllabus, right? I have not. Okay, so for due dates, we're still going in the same order as the syllabus, mm -hmm. and he will get it updated, but he teaches a lot of classes. The way, the place to look for your due, date, due dates is the week by week, and if you go to any given week, it will tell you, yeah. this is what Heidi's going to talk about in class. This is what your discussion is going to be. This is what your quiz is going to be. This is what to do. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, what's your thoughts on paper lights for these assignments? That's a Dr. Wine. It says in there that they have to have so like, I mean, what's your I do quiz.